You're listening to Changing Reality. Changing Reality, where we bend reality all across the world. Only on WQHS Radio. So hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Changing Reality. My name is Harsha and I'm so, so excited to have all of you here with us on this amazing episode. So for all of you who don't know, Changing Reality is a show that features phenomenal people from all walks of life who are changing the world around them. So we'll be hanging out and interviewing with social change makers, entrepreneurs, business owners, to even artists, musicians, top executives, and inspiring individuals from all across the world. Many of them who were once here on the Penn campus themselves. So we get to hear all of these inspiring stories on how they're changing their reality. And at the same time, we get to see how we can do the same in the areas that we are passionate about, in the areas that we love. And I wanted to do this show simply because I feel like there are a lot of people out there who do phenomenal things and make waves in the lives of those around them. And I'm passionate about learning these stories so that others can figure out how they can make their mark as well in their own capacity. Personally, I founded and run a youth movement called Ascendance in Malaysia, which is where I'm from, that collaborates with international organizations, the Ministry of Education over there, and places all over around the globe to help provide an alternative education platform for any student who wants to change their reality. We work with students from elementary all the way up to college through various sessions, programs, experiential learning activities and projects that help them not only discover their passion, but learn about themselves through the world around them. Go out there and get their own career started from learning from uh, top people in the industries and come back and start businesses or start their own career as a musician, filmmaker, entrepreneur that not only benefits themselves, but creates meaningful impact for those around them. So to date, we've been really fortunate to work with over 15,000 students in 970 communities and have incubated countless number of student-run projects, social enterprises, and much more run by kids aged 8 to 25 years old. So as you can see, helping people change their reality is part of who I am in a sense. And we've been lucky just to show you how powerful stories can be that it's because this main component of sharing experiences, of getting people who are successful to give a little bit of a slice into their life to others who may be just starting out, that we've managed to create so much change and an entire movement around the globe. In fact, this September, we're actually having a conference for 50,000 students all across the globe. And the speakers of this conference themselves are young change makers, multiple award-winning social entrepreneurs, and at the same time, even young activists who are creating sustainable change in 10 different countries. We have students who are 10 years old from Tanzania working on financial literacy startups. We have 18 year olds from Italy who work on healthcare startups. And all of these students are between the age of 10 to 25 years old and they are creating change for the community. And we are providing this platform for people all around the globe to come together and see how we can collectively build the future. So that just goes to show you how powerful stories really are. Together, when we share these experiences, we really do change reality. We really provide the resources and platform for actionable change. And hopefully through this show, you guys, our lovely audience today, get to find out how you can do that in your own life and learn how we can all live in a better world in a sense. So if you have any questions about it, do drop it in the show chat below and I will take them. Uh, you can ask any question that you want about our lovely speaker today, about her experiences or anything else that you want to know. And if you've got any topics or suggestions of stuff that you want to hear, drop it down below and who knows, your idea might be our next episode. So if you aren't tuning in from our WQHS radio directly, you may have noticed something a little different about today's episode or most notably the fact that we're actually streaming on Facebook Live today. So no, it's not an accident. You tuned in for the right show. But today we actually have a very, very special episode featuring Kim Stonehaus, the head of automotive at Facebook US. And she is someone who is so inspiring. She's personally a rock star in this whole industry. She leads an entire team across the states that helps auto marketers and dealers transform their brands, grow sales, and drive loyalty in a mobile-first world. 
So prior to Facebook, she had um, an amazing career in places like Google, where she, her team basically um, used research and growth strategy to translate findings to content and media strategies for their partners in not just the, automa the automotive industry, but in every other industry that you can think of, from F&B, media and entertainment, packaged goods, and many others. So in more than 15 years in this industry, Kim has led global and U.S. partnerships across a dozen of brands. And at the same time, she has pioneered customer-centric innovations that technology can afford us in, in this modern day and age. As I mentioned, rock star in this industry. So she has been recognized among Automotive News' 40 Under 40 and has been featured within forums including eMarketer, Media Post, Automotive News, World Congress, and many, many others. So I think at this point, you guys are like, oh my God, Harsha, please invite her on screen. We really would love to meet her. So I shall not um, torture you any longer with anticipation and would like to welcome Kim onto the screen with us. Hi, Harsha. Hi, Kim. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wonderful. I should bring you around with me. That was a real uh, confidence boost and walk down memory lane. So thank you for that intro. Well, thank you very much. And thank you so much for joining us. How are you feeling? Is everything OK? Did I catch you in the middle of like a thunderstorm or something? Or are we good to go? Oh, no, no, good to go. Kids are in bed. This is great. Uh, quiet house. So uh, and really, really glad to be here. Uh, what you do, the work that you do is just incredible. And what an amazing group of young folks that you work with. So just glad to be here for the conversation. Oh, thank you. You're way too kind. And as I said, we've got students from everything everywhere that I know who have been so keen to listen to your experiences. And personally, as a student at Penn, I've been really fortunate to have those resources to bring what I do to the next level and meet people like you. You are actually a student at Penn yourself, right? Yes. Yes. Um, dear old Penn, way back when. Yes. All right. And you did a bachelor's in arts, communication and commerce, which itself is like an interesting combination of like everything that you could have possibly thought of. So how were you like even prior to your time at Penn? When did you actually consider like, hmm, I want to go to this university? They don't seem too bad in a sense. And <laughs> yeah, when did we get the good luck or like why did we get the good fortune of having you there? Gosh, well, I went to Penn. My experiences with Penn started with the Penn Relays, oldest and you know largest track meet right in the in the country, at least at the collegiate level, I'm sure. And uh, did that in high school. I was a runner in high school, and we took the trip, drove in a van from Maryland, and I was just blown away by the incredible atmosphere at Franklin Field and the campus itself is, as you know, just absolutely gorgeous. So that was my my first experience and, and uh, intro into the world of Penn. All right, amazing. And you're like not too shabby. I think I could like be part of this in a sense. So how did you actually go about like um, applying to Penn? How did you even feel when you first got into Penn in a sense? Yeah. Um, I, I think I barely made it into Penn, to be honest. I was, you know, I, I, I did I did well, but I wasn't the very top of my class from an academic standpoint. And I was a good runner, but I wasn't recruited. I wasn't on that national stage. So I was, I, I, I think I was, you know, on the cusp in both places. And I actually, put a pitch together. I found all of my little local newspaper clippings of different races that I had run. I, I wrote up a running resume. Uh, I, I did track and cross country in high school and I sent it in. And, um, you know, I think that that's more common now, but at the time, I think it was either you're, you're sort of recruited or, or it's not happening for you. And I remember it just being so thrilled and honored that I got to take the train up to Penn. And I remember being in coach Betty Costanza's office and she was looking over my stats and she said, I think we can use you. And <laughs> I was like, yes, I think this, you know, this, this, this might, this might work out. And it all worked out in the end, SAT scores and all those things lined up. Uh, and so, yeah, so I walked into Penn feeling like 
I had just made it in and I, but I was very proud as well because I felt like I had, you know, put myself out there to, um, to make it happen. Yeah, I think that's amazing. And that's so I think that that's very meaningful for a lot of students who are going through this summer wondering what they should do, like, where do they go from here? And I like how that kind of like it's a bit kind of like foreshadowing the stuff that you do, putting together the pitch, kind of like having that little <laughs> sales thing on. But I shouldn't spoil anything for our audience. But that is very, very amazing. I'd say and I think it shows a lot of your character. And even at Penn, you did so many amazing things. You had this concentration, which I think is um, a little complicated for the simple minded like me. Um, again, arts, communication and commerce. It's like, what did you not do in a sense? And you were also involved in sports. Uh, you were a division one athlete. You were at the Daily Pennsylvania. So you also had this report, like this whole uh, reporter industry experience. How did you bring all of these experiences together in a sense? Well, uh, I didn't do all of those things all at the same time. So Let's see. Well, I first started out thinking that I was going to be a pediatrician and I think I, I, I was pre-med for, you know, maybe a month or so. I, uh, I'm pretty sure that I said I wanted to be a pediatrician at a young age and got a lot of positive reinforcement for that. So just kind of blindly going along that, that track until I remember being in a chemistry class at Penn and thinking, whoa, this is, this is not the way my brain works. I, you know, I made it through AP Calc, but this is, this is not happening. And I was honest enough with myself to say, we're going to have to rethink this. And I wound up in just interested. And I think I think it was a, a political comms class. I don't remember exactly which one was the first, but I was just intrigued and I and I took it for fun. And uh, I just kept going in that direction and then found out that there was this concentration that's available of comm and commerce, communications and, and commerce. Uh, had an interest in in business as well. And so I just kept kind of inching in that direction. Uh, I was I was on the cross country team and the track team when I started out as a freshman. To be honest, I think I was just kind of making my way through being a freshman, being on a college campus, making friends, having fun, and I wasn't as as dedicated as as you really really need to be to be successful. And at the same time, I had this burgeoning new interest in. Uh, other activities at Penn, you know, I was going in this direction and I saw the DP and I thought that was pretty cool. And, uh, and, and so I said, you know, I want to, I want to give it a shot. And I, I said to the coach, I said, I'm, I would like to take, I think I said a, a year or two off and, and maybe I'll, I'll come back my junior year. And I think it's a credit to the team that they said, OK, we'll leave the door open. We'll see if you can come back and you can hack it and you train for it, then maybe we'll take you back. And I had a ton of fun selling ads uh, for the Daily Pennsylvanian. I still have one of the tear sheets of my very first one. It was Tiffany's uh, down in in you know downtown in Philadelphia, uh, but I really really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed being a part of a student run organization that was was so successful from a journalism standpoint, and the business team was a lot of fun too. Uh, but I did have this feeling my I think it was the end of my maybe somewhere in my junior year of. Um, and I'll never have the opportunity again to get the times that I want to tell my grandkids about. I didn't give this running thing its full shot. And I need to I need to go back and, and see what I'm capable of. And so I trained harder than I ever had. I dedicated my really dedicated myself to it. There was it was, you know, school and running pretty much. And uh, and I'm was was really proud to come away with a few accomplishments and best times and and things like that. So, long story, but uh, what looks 
nice and neat on paper was really me figuring myself out, finding my way and and just kind of inching in directions and exploring. And that's what college should be about. So if you're in college and you're looking around and it looks like things are perfect and people have it figured out, probably not entirely the case behind the scenes. And it's really OK if, if you're not, because, my gosh, I would be miserable and probably highly unsuccessful if I had you know, forced myself to go down a scientific path that was just not the way my brain works. Yeah, and I just wanted, like, I, I just think that's really meaningful because, again, a lot of people are in that summer where they're either in between years at college or getting into it or even just leaving college. And sometimes I think we feel like halfway, like, on the journey, like, oh, this isn't for me or, oh, my interest has changed a little. So to kind of, like, reconcile all of the stuff that they do kind of, like, takes a little bit of, like, especially if you're an insecure college student, kind of, like, takes a lot of, like, will in a sense. So to hear that someone as successful as you was once in our shoes, I think that's really refreshing like whew, we've got hope still in a sense so thank you for sharing yeah. and <laughs> yeah we're all figuring it out i mean people are still you know everyone humans humans everyone's just trying to figure it out and that changes over time your life changes what you're trying to figure out changes but i feel like it's you know a constant part of the human experience that everyone is is going through all right, very cool. And speaking about insecure, slightly disillusioned college students, how were you like when you, no, I'm just saying, but how were you like when you left Penn in a sense? You got, I think, um, the next thing that you did was, again, in advertising sales at National Geographic. So like, how did you even get there in a way? And like, how was that experience from you just leaving college, being in this huge organization? How did you get there? How was it like? Was it everything we dream of when we are in class right now? Well, let's see. So I I had done internships in the same direction. So production intern at CBS News one summer and then um, uh, a production company, a small one outside of Philadelphia another summer. So I just I was I was I kept going in that direction of I like media. I like marketing. Let's keep moving in that direction. So, yeah, I mean, I remember, gosh, on campus, if you're really in Wharton, right? So I took some classes at Wharton, but I wasn't a part of the Wharton school. If you're really in Wharton, you're seeing people lined up to be recruited to consulting firms and uh, and big banks. And that was, that was not me. And I was just trying to find something. I was trying to find a foot in the door. And, um, I ended up finding and applying to uh, to the National Geographic Channel, and the only position they had at the time was uh, was was a, an assistant to the SVP of Sales. So it's not the typical track uh, if you want to get more into marketing or or partnering with big brands and things like that, but. Uh, I met him. His name is Rich Goldfar. We still chat every once in a while to this day. And he, I could tell that he was, he, he said, I, I will, I'll teach you. I'll teach you about this business. You will be running around and, you know, grabbing coffee and printing things and doing all of those things, but I will teach you. And that was really appealing to me. And I, I would, I would say that's something to look for in your first job and early on for sure is that kind of willingness. I would, I would get my, I would have my notepad that I would just keep throughout the week. And every Friday when we would go over things for the next week, you would say, okay, what are your questions from this week? And I just got to run through all of them. And I learned so much from that uh, senior perspective of what ultimately in the, in the next several jobs, I would be working towards the interests of someone at that level. So it gave me this wonderful grounding sense of um of of what what mattered i was also a waitress i had to waitress in order to afford my room in the apartment that i lived in in new york but hey i was in new york uh and i was i was going after it so i was i was happy 
All right. And oh God, that's like a lot of things to do at the time on one side. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm just thinking like, how many hours do you have, Kim? Like even now you run triathlon. So it's like how many hours are in your day? But it's okay. So it's like, so on one side, you're, you're having some amazing learning experiences. You're making ends meet. So you're doing everything that you can to kind of like pursue something that you love in a sense, which is very bold and it seems to work out for you well. But like, how did, what was the one thing that you feel um, enabled you to succeed in all of these things? Because there's so many things that can go wrong. You could burn out, you could have someone who's not a good mentor. You might not be aware of how to actually make the best out of the situation of learning from someone in that position. So what was the one thing that you think you did right that enabled you to balance all of that? Gosh, you know, it's hard to pin it to one thing uh, I'll, so I'll give two answers. One is, is the, the obvious one, but I immediately, my mind immediately goes to some, some late nights and some hard work early on. Uh, I can see myself at a desk at a, at a pretty late hour. I don't recommend that for everyone necessarily, but that's, that's, I mean, frankly, and there are a million ways to be successful. I just want to put that out there. Uh, for me, spending some extra time and to, to be over prepared and maybe to overcompensate for some insecurities early on. That was, that was definitely, that's the reality. That was, that was a key for me. Uh, and then the other thing I'll say is, is being nimble to, to take on projects and find new things that aren't being solved for because someone doesn't really have time for it, or it's a new space. I mean, even now I'm thinking of, we have a help wanted board for our team of, of problems that we need to solve or uh, new things that we can tackle. They're not absolutely urgent, but but someone, you know, normally from one of the, the folks on our leadership team will, will say, hey, help wanted, this is something. And I feel like whether there's a help wanted board or not, those opportunities exist absolutely everywhere, every single company. And so, you know, find your help wanted boards and, and go after those projects, make mistakes and, and, and you'll get access and learning opportunities through that. And that'll help you grow more quickly. All right. That's very, very good advice. And also to kind of like pursue those things, which are not really kind of like, like help wanted stuff is not really your job, but kind of like just saying, you know what, let me learn, let me go and tackle this, let me solve a problem. And I think that, again, for someone who's just starting out, that may not be like obvious for us to do, but it, like, it does sound very enriching in a sense. So after that, you moved to Google, right? And you started off there, um, again, uh, very humbly as an account planner, but eventually went all the way up to kind of like their head of industry. So wow, that's amazing. And first of all, why did you even go to Google? Were you one of those like foresight, like people who were like, oh my God, the tech industry is going to bloom. I've got to get on it now. Or was it just like by chance? So this is just me assessing if I should listen to your advice for lottery tickets or if I should just like. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I remember when I, when I left, I had a lot of people looking at me like the little blue link company, you're, you're going to go over there. <laughs> uh, you know, I've always been attracted to, so I, you, you talked about my resume a little bit, but there's a lot of consumer behavior in there, or people's behavior and, and uh, sort of chasing an understanding of that. And uh, that changes over time. And it's really interesting to be a part of it in a marketing context when you're involved in, in that changing over time. So that's what attracted me to Google really was was it was something that was very new and I could see why that was was making a difference in the world and um, I just wanted to be a part of it. Cool. And when you were in Google, you worked on so many different industries. I think you yeah. like I know how they say like the tech companies now know you better than you know yourself. Like and I, and I, I don't mind. It's nice that somebody knows me. I'm like gonna be honest, but like you went through like many different industries, you explored so many different things. Um, I think automotive was one of it, but again, as I mentioned earlier, you had things like from F and B, packaged goods. So how did you kind of navigate that? Oh, automotive industry, that's the thing that I want. Was that even like something you went in with or was it something that you got from exploring all of these different things and discovered that that was the best fit for you? 
Well, I, mean, I guess a couple things. I they did ask me. I think Google was staffing up at the time, and they said, "Hey, you know, we have a position in consumer packaged goods, and we have another one in automotive. What's what are you drawn towards?" And I was just drawn towards the complexity of the purchase. I thought, okay, this is this has some really rich marketing challenges to solve. So that's kind of what hooked me. Um, and then, and then from there, so, sorry, tell me again, you want me to talk about just the, the different industries or remind me? A little bit about like how your experience was going through these different industries. Oh, yeah. So how did you discover that automotive was the industry for you? Yes, well, I, so that's how I, how I got into automotive. My dad is a really big, car guy um but i think that was subconscious if anything it wasn't i wasn't trying to follow in his footsteps i'm not a gearhead like he is i you know i have fond memories of of his cars and and all of that but um but for me it really was it was it was the the marketing problems that were were so interesting to me and then you know, bopping around different verticals um, that happened over time where I, I, I spent a lot of time in automotive and then towards the end expanded as I was, um, you know, leading teams across multiple verticals. Um, I'll say one thing that I ended up doing is I went back to school at night. I was um, I was going to NYU to get my marketing research certificate because it sort of happened over time that I all of a sudden I was responsible for this research budget that continued to grow. And I looked around and I said, you know, Penn's great, but I don't know that my undergrad education is is uh, really sufficient for me to feel absolutely confident about, uh, you know, being in some of these conversations with different research vendors and, and making absolute best best use of things. So, you know, being honest with yourself and you could be over your head and embracing that and just solving for it. Um, that was one way that I that I did that and was able to, I think that that certainly helped me. Um, but you also, you gain this pattern recognition by, by going to other verticals. I think you become stronger in the vertical you return to. I'm stronger in automotive because I got some exposure to other purchase processes and, and got to see how, how they worked a bit differently and, and how they work the same and what you can borrow and what you can bring back and, and some places where other industries are innovating that, that maybe auto, you know, can catch up. Oh, that's actually pretty cool because many times I feel like we think that oh, if I'm an in this, I'm like if I'm in this industry, I've got to know like everything here, and I've got to like, spend all my time there. But I guess it's it is kind of interesting how by spending a little bit of time in other industries, you kind of like see their innovation, like notice trends that are similar. And does that help back when you go back to the same industry that you were originally from? And are you able to apply those different experiences in a way that kind of helps you grow? Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm what what I and I would say, you know, multiple industries and then also multiple angles. So, you know, I was I was in a sales role partnering with automotive brands and then I was in a a, a role on the global team which supported and partnered with those sales teams. Uh, in coordinating global campaigns. So I sort of, they became the people, the, the role I was in that became my client, so to speak, internally. And then moving over into the, the marketing and consumer research side, understanding those other two roles and what they were looking for. So bouncing around and seeing problems from different angles is also, I think, very enriching and, and, and helps you as a, a you know, a strong foundation to grow right. from. Very, very cool. And you then went to Facebook. You were, again, in this amazing um, automotive industry, started as an industry manager. Today, you're the director of that whole division. So how, in a sense, okay, first of all, we've got to talk about how do you grow so far, like so fast, in a sense? Like, what do you think was the one skill that you had that showed people around you that you were capable, you knew what your stuff, and then you could actually kind of like excel in it? Uh, that's a big question. Well, there, it's not one skill. I think if anything, it's, it's having a sense for where your skills are and where your skills aren't. Um, you know, I, so 
I mentioned the the bouncing around to different roles and and I wasn't in a straight line of um of of being a partner to these clients and just moving directly up in that ladder one lane of experience. And in some ways I think that you know that I I lean on those people on on my team. They're incredible. They understand media and the history down to like the nth degree that and and they're brilliant that's not me i have to to know what i'm what i'm good at and where where i where i come from like what my my interest has always been which is you know as i said consumer behavior the path to purchase understanding how technology intersects with what with what brands are, are trying to do and their strategies so um uh and I, I think those multiple angles and, and my more jagged path, perhaps, uh, ultimately was valuable because now I work with that marketing team who does our marketing. Um, I I work with the operations team. I work with these different teams where I have. I work with the global team that we, you know, in, in roles that that I used to have. So. Um, so I think that that's valuable. But as I said before, there are a million ways to be successful. You just have to know yourself and what you do bring to the table, be confident in that, and then uh, build up a really strong team around you. In my case, I, I inherited an incredibly strong team and we've, we've grown from there a bit, um, but they're absolutely amazing. And they're all very different, and I I I listen to them. Um, I and that's that's my leadership team that I get to work with. That's um, you know all of the individual folks on the team as well. They are they are closest to our customers, and that's the source of of the very very best ideas. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Bob Lanham is our head of automotive retail, and he talks to dealers day in and day out. And uh, he he recommended to me a couple years ago. He said, "Kim, we really need to have our own Facebook group where we can spark a community, and dealers can ask each other questions about." you know, the best things to do on Facebook and, and troubleshoot and, and talk together and not just about Facebook, but all means of marketing. And in my mind, I was I was going through all the risks and all the ways we might not be prepared for how that could grow or or what if we did it and nobody showed up? How embarrassing would that be? And I, I, I came from a mindset of 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 risk, frankly, and but he just he knew he knew that this was necessary because he's he's talking to them every day. And uh, long story short, he was beyond right. There are almost four thousand people in our Facebook auto marketing collective today, and it's highly it's a highly engaged community of uh, people exchanging ideas and were involved. But there so. So, um, so yeah, you've got to, you've got to really listen to your people. And, and I think there's a phrase that ideas come from everywhere, but I, I truly think that the best ideas come up, come from the people who are closest to our customers and anything we've done well has bubbled up from, from that. I, that's amazing. And I think that is a reflection of good leadership in a sense that you know the strengths of the people around you. You're willing to listen to their ideas. And at the same time, you create a culture that enables them to kind of like express their ideas, enables them to think beyond like the problems that they're solving on a day to day basis. So kudos to you. And what do you like share with us a little bit about how you, you learned to be a good leader in a way for all of the executives listening in who are struggling to manage their own teams? Oh gosh. Well, let's see. I mean, I've I've had some I've had some very good examples along the way and I try to steal good ideas from wherever I can. So we I I follow many leaders that I admire whether that's you know, on Instagram, on Facebook, or within our own company, we have our our internal Facebook, which is called Workplace, and and you can see, and I'll, I'll see. I love how that person handled that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow that. I'm gonna make that our own for our automotive team. So um, that's 
I, I think when you when you think about mentorship, it can come in so many forms. It's great if you can find that mentor who's going to talk through everything on Fridays. But there are so many ways to get exposure to to different leaders. I mean, what you do here and and grabbing people and and uh, hearing your stories is is one one example. Um, let's see. What else? What else? I mean, it's, I guess, you know, one, one thing is that it's really not about you, um, which <laughs> I find comforting at the end of the day. Sometimes I don't do this very often. I don't do interviews like this very often. It's not my comfort zone. Frankly, I'd much rather light someone else up to who's, who that's, that's their comfort zone. Again, playing to your strengths and, and allowing others to, to play to theirs. But I do think it's, it's helpful to, to know when you're a leader that it really isn't about you. It's, it's, I, I am one person. And so it's about creating organization structure opportunities for people to own and and go off and, and take their ideas and thrive. That's that's what leadership really is. That's brilliant. And I know you say you don't do interviews, so thank you so much. And you are amazing. So just like relax and like <laughs> No, I, I'm going to be honest. I actually think you're a really good presenter. I actually watched one of your presentations in, I think, it was media post. They had like a live session. I, I can't remember like what the exact thing is, but you were giving a presentation. And I just noticed that you were just really humble. You knew your stuff. Um, and, and it was just really nice to see you interview so well. So in a way, like like when it comes to like stepping out of your comfort zone, because I feel like this is something that you'd have to do a lot at such a like high position, global, um, national position in a sense. How do you even step out of your comfort zone and do things that may not always be your strength, but is required for that moment or has a huge benefit at that moment, and yet you do it so phenomenally, so effortlessly in a sense? Oh gosh, well thank you for that. I think uh, you tell someone and then you're committed. You tell someone that you're going to do it and, and yeah, and, and don't do, yeah, don't do things alone. Things are, are you, you get momentum from just have the first meeting or have, or say it out loud. Uh, and, and that way you can't, you can't get out of it. You know, you're, you're, you're committed, there's momentum and, and off you go. It's kind of like, you know, I, I still run, as you mentioned, I don't do triathlons anymore. That was, pre kid but um but i still run and it's kind of like you know you sign up for the race and it's it's far away and it's a good thing you did and then you get on the starting line and you're like oh my gosh you know you have all of those questions but sorry the gun's going off and and so if you just inch your way there take the first step whatever it is speaking engagement big presentation um, whatever it is, just, you know, take the first step and, and have someone with you and off you go. Okay. Very good advice. I'm going to use that and sign myself up for all of those things that I'm supposed to do, but I'm just a little bit nervous. about. <laughs> so like, if you see me have a post on like Facebook or LinkedIn going like, I'm so nervous. It's all Kim's fault. It is all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, no, and see, look at you you do a wonderful job and so you would never know you would never know that you're you're nervous about anything because think about all the things you've accomplished you'd be surprised and like <laughs> you are definitely a role model for all of us who want to do things and again uh, i think we've got a lot of like questions from the audience a lot of them going like oh my god kim this is amazing both on our channel and also here at the <laughs> side saying nice sharing this is lovely and we do have another question that's actually from the audience which is how do you deal with team members who make a mistake or when there's an issue in the organization what's your strategy going in are you good cop bad cop a little bit of both or <laughs> like what do you do in a sense yeah, well, and Facebook is absolutely a culture of feedback, and it's a really good thing. Um, I love the phrase that it, it, only your friends will tell you when you have food on your face. Um, I've tried to, I've tried to say that, and I hope that my team feels that I model that, that I want their feedback. I it is inevitable that we all have blind spots and we're inevitably doing, we're making mistakes, we're all human. Uh, so I think that the first thing is that you wanna have a, a culture where feedback is, is known as a tool, is known as normal. 
Um, and then you also, you have to make sure that you're acknowledging all the things that are wonderful and uh, that your team feels appreciated um, because otherwise it, it, there, I think there was, there was a study done that, that people overweight negative or constructive feedback seven to one, right. Versus, versus something positive. Again, we are all human. We are all insecure beings wandering this earth. <laughs> so that when I learned that I was like, wow, that is, that is is really really important to to keep in mind. Um, so I come from a growth mindset, and again, maybe it ties back to running. You can be really slow, and you can improve. So everything can be improved. And I think anytime there's a feedback situation, it's about we have a bigger goal here, we have a bigger opportunity here, and here's how we're going to get there. It's it's less about you know, what was what was wrong or backtracking and more about the, the future. Um, and I, I try to, you know, take that that approach to things. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, feedback is feedback is a gift. Um, I hope that people see that I I model that and I ask for it. I share my reviews. I share what I'm working on. I share when I get constructive feedback from my manager um, because we just have to normalize it. It's just, we're all trying to improve. Normalize it. That's really great and model it for your team. I think that answers the question. And I'm gonna be honest, as someone who's both like a leader and at the same time, someone who's in a team with other people, I think that seeing when my leaders go like, oh, it's all right, like I, I get this too, or like, oh, I've got this comment that I'm working on. And just like seeing that help really helps me replicate that. And it's amazing that you have such a lovely team that has you as their leader. And like, I've got to ask though, how do you deal with like your own insecurities in a sense? So like when you are like, again, huge role and things like that. So when you are doing something and maybe you make a mistake or maybe you say the wrong thing, or even if you said all the right things and everyone's going like, hmm, are you sure you know what you're talking about kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. How do you actually deal with that and like still push through in a way? Hmm, let's see. I mean, one thing that comes to mind is you know, there's inevitably, there's stress, there are things that you're trying to work through. I can, you know, you've got a really important meeting um, and you're nervous about it. So that comes to mind for me. That's what I immediately think of. And I, I, will, I will tell myself, you're in the before. And that is really helpful and calming to me because if you're in the before, if there's a before, there's an after. And that reminds me that I've done this before. Maybe it wasn't exactly the same, but this feeling that I'm feeling is natural. There will be an after. I kind of reflect on the after and remind myself that it was silly if I was stressed out about something because it, it turned out okay. Uh, so yeah, that's... <laughs> That's, you're in the before, you're in the before, it's okay. There will be an after, you will come up with the idea, you will figure it out, you will pull in someone else, you will collaborate, you will you will figure it out together. Um, there will be an after, there's always an after, you know, just so you don't get too wrapped up in it. Um, and I also, I'm looking over at this, I sent this to my, to my team because to your point of, I'll explain it and then, uh, of just of insecurities. I worry about my team and insecurities, especially while we're all working from home in that you don't have the immediate feedback that you get when you're around other people. You don't have as much of an opportunity for a sense of security. Okay, I'm doing a good job. People are smiling around me. Things are okay. And so I just, I, I sent this little thing to... <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, very good. I, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I love staring at it myself because yes, we are a feedback culture, constant improvement, all of those things, very high expectations, always looking to improve. But um, everyone's just better and happier and I think more productive as a team if you come from a place of calm and confidence. So I just want that. I just want that for everyone. You've got this in other words. All right. Yeah. No, no. 
and and it's so sweet that you actually sent it to them because I feel like one of the things like during the pandemic is we've all kind of like like gone a bit disembodied. It's like where am I? Who am I? In a sense, so sometimes just getting something physical in the mail is just like oh my god, there's a world outside. <laughs> So it's like it's so sweet of you to actually do that and again on the same vein of this pandemic like mm-hmm. i think compared to all industries you're in a really weird place because like on one side you've got the whole automotive industry and i don't think it's been like so smooth sailing during the pandemic i mean first of all nobody's really like allowed to drive for like a year and then you've had to like at the same time like be on their side but you are also in a company that is at the forefront of this. I feel like I personally have used Facebook so much more in the last year and a half than I would have done in any other lifetime or any other situation. So again, you are like in an industry that is maybe suffering a little bit due to the pandemic, but also in a company that actually has the solutions and actually is the best person to kind of like provide the solutions. So you being in the middle of all of this, tell us about how it was like coming up with ideas to solve problems or even just talking to the clients and calming them down during this period. Well, so actually, we about this pen holder too, because then I would definitely want to. Did you send them like a, you got this oh, pen? Oh, like, no. <laughs> like, that yeah. cool. <laughs> you know, actually, I would say that they inspired us through uh-huh. the pandemic. So the, spe- I mean, automotive, the automotive purchase is, is one of the few, right? It's one of the hardest to bring online. Uh, and the speed of our partners, the speed of these automotive brands in figuring out how to bring as many steps as possible online, whether that's the ability to sign the paperwork online. Uh, We had a number of brands revealing new vehicles on Facebook Live. We had brands uh, doing doing um, walk arounds of, of vehicles and dealers closing sales and doing that using Facebook Live or Instagram Live, um, testing Messenger to you know ramp up what we call conversational commerce. So allowing dealers to connect with people one to one. You don't have to send an email or fill out a form and wait. It's all. You know, it's all all brought together and and as quick as you want the conversation to happen. So we saw a ton of innovation and that was just I mean, you can you imagine how much fun that was for our team to work with our, our partners who were moving so quickly in order to make those rapid changes because they had to um, They're You know, we work with brilliant marketers and uh, the way they stood up these completely new operations and and ran it all the way from brand through their dealers was just uh, astounding. It was it was very incredible to to see and be a part of. Okay, that's amazing. And again, you guys did so many cool things like I saw like AR ads in a sense for like yeah. cars. like, okay, I would not have thought of that. But again, definitely inspiring definitely a lesson to every other industry in a sense that hey if they can bring this industry online what are you guys doing in a sense like, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean the ability to to see if that you know if that that full-size suv is gonna fit in your garage you know so not just ar but um to scale uh, you know, so what what people have used to see, can you try and do these sunglasses look good on your face uh, to see that being used in the auto industry? It was just it has been amazing. And it's it's I think that was just the start of it. It really sparked through, uh, you know, creativity loves constraint. That's another phrase that I love. Not my own, obviously, but <laughs> um, but it's really, really true. And that's what we saw over the last year. All right, very cool. And I also saw that you spoke previously about something called discovery commerce. 
and mm -hmm. that I think that that is becoming more and more rampant in this um, increasingly digital age, in a sense. And mm -hmm. the gist of it, I may explain this terribly since you're actually the professional at this, so like be, like be prepared. But I think the gist of it is we're moving into kind of like a world where no longer is it like, hmm, maybe I might find an ad that would suit what I want. But as the consumer, you're like, why isn't this ad exactly what I was looking for? Like, mm -hmm. why isn't it that I want coming to me, in a sense? So share with us a little bit about how this whole industry of ads is transforming in a way into something that is more customer centric. And what does that mean for all of the businesses out there? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because we, we went all the way back and I talked about, you know, being at, at Google and TV and everything. And, and um, so there's always been change in, in behavior and, and what technology can enable. And I remember a time where, and this is probably 12 or 15 years ago, where, you know, you have that evolution from people doing all of their research in a dealership to where we used to say, tire kickers are now mouse clickers. And <laughs> And I mean, we laugh now because it's just it's just so obvious. But back then that you had to have a tagline because that was that was a novel concept. And so you went into this place where people are doing all of this research online and then that became normal and then it moved to mobile. And now the new experience and consumer expectation is that I shouldn't have to do all of that research the right vehicle should be brought to me. I should just discover it on my phone the same way that all of the people and moments and causes and inspiration that I care about are curated for me in my Facebook feed and my Instagram feed, that the right vehicle for me when I'm in market for a vehicle, that should also be a part of that experience. And, uh, and so that's discovery, we're seeing it we're seeing auto brands really start to take advantage of, of that as a tool and shift their mindset to that expectation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pushed by the experience that people are having in all of their other purchases. So in the retail sector, uh, the, the expectation is that it's five taps to check out from being served the perfect you know, shirt or necklace or sandals, or in my case, running shorts to check out. Um, so that, you know, that, that convenient discovery all the way through frictionless purchase, that's the journey that we're on right now. Five times, okay, got it, five times, got it. I'll make sure. Amazing. Think about that, think about that. And, that, and that's, you know, I think we'll be the same way we laugh at the, the whole mouse clickers thing. I think that five years from now, we'll be in a place where that is absolutely the norm. And there's a sort of corollary experience to that in automotive. And again, I think we, we saw such acceleration in that direction over the last year. And, and I kind of like, like from a customer's point of view, I kind of like see how the mindset of like myself and the people around me change. Like I, 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 I'm guilty. I used to do a lot of research. Now I just trust every ad that comes up. Like, yeah, this is perfect for me. Good job, Facebook, in a sense. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, who did you know, in a sense? And at the same time, I feel like, someone who runs a small business nothing is huge as the clients that you work with but i also see sometimes that clients now expect that i had like the first thing they saw is the thing for them in a way or it's like and then they don't really do as much as research as i think they would have done earlier so it's definitely a shift in mindset it's just something that i feel all of us need to kind of like be aware of and in all of these changing times or even in your day-to-day -day operations there's literally so many things that are evolving how do you stay on top of all of this? You work with changing technologies, changing mindsets, changing people. How, how do you cope? <laughs> hmm. Well, I think it's, I think it's thrilling. Uh, I like change, you know, I, when we first work from home, I was like, this is novel. Okay. And you know, now I'm looking forward to being back and it won't be the same. And so I don't know, I guess if you're in this industry, you're probably drawn to change and you've, you've got to get comfortable with it. Um, but that's, that's not to say that it isn't hard sometimes. It, let's be honest here. You know, the industry is going through a ton of change. It's happening all the time. Just when we think 
that we've got it figured out. We think, okay, we're, you know, re-emerging from the COVID situation in automotive. Our clients are grappling with this, you know, massive global uh, semiconductor shortage. Uh, so we're, I, I think we've gotten to a place where we have a bit of a playbook to deal with change because it's come at us so many times that it's kind of like, you've got to be ready for the unexpected. I've, I've, I've grown, a little bit more comfortable, you know, with, with that. Um, we, you know, whether it's, it's dealing with the change from work to home or, or, or now we're dealing with, you know, changes in the ads ecosystem, you've got to have a plan and you've got to be prepared to test your way through and not hold on to too tightly to any, um, any, you know, specific solutions that you thought were going to be right. You know, we've learned so much. If you think about the COVID situation, we learned so much over the last year and um, we're learning so much as we help our, our clients as they work through this inventory shortage as well. And, and so that's kind of the mantra is, is have a plan and test your way, test your way through. All right. So, but that's, I, I like that. It's a little paradoxical, have a plan, but I expect the unexpected and expect to evolve. And I feel like mm -hmm. any entrepreneur would definitely be able to get that. And if not, you should definitely write a book called The Playbook of Change. I think it's so like, <laughs> oh, I really like the way you phrased it. I'm like, I'd read that. But <laughs> with all of these things going on, um, you're definitely someone that I think we can all look to if we want to work with someone. Uh, if we want to like be like you, run an entire industry and in one of the biggest companies out there. And a lot of your clients are huge players in the industry. A lot of them are at the forefront of it. And you do an amazing job serving them, meeting their needs, getting your team rallied up to support them in whatever way you can. But on the flip side, what is one thing that you feel that you'd wish in a sense that your clients would know about the work that you guys do because again i feel like people who work on like the ad side are often like not so appreciated i know i don't appreciate the person who runs my digital marketing as much i'm sorry ramya i appreciate you but like for you like, like, what is the one thing that you wish that your clients knew that is a great question um well let's see i do I, I do think that um, we do. So we do. We care very deeply. And I remember being in a meeting once back in the office where we were all sitting around a table obsessing, as we often do, obsessing over um, a client's performance and what is the learning agenda that we're going to develop, like the, the series of tests in order to improve their performance. And um, we were, you know, talking about everything from their end business goal to how they think about marketing, how they think about our, I mean, and I remember just thinking, oh my gosh, if they only knew that we've been in this room for the last four hours, obsessing over their business, their success. I think they know that, we, I think our clients know that we care. Um, but you know, we, we hop on every live, we rally around it as a team. And when they reveal a vehicle at 9 PM on a Tuesday, we're all there cheering them on. Uh, we do obsess about their performance and, you know, have a marketing science team, a creative shop team dedicated to coming up with ideas and working with their agencies. We listen to every earnings call. Uh, and so, yeah, I guess if, if they were a fly on the wall, I wonder if they they would know like just how much we care. But, um, you know, it's a it's a great question. And I think if I asked my my clients like I should ask them the same question, really, because I think everybody would have a really, really interesting answer to that. And, uh, you know, so much more gets done. I think when you have that curiosity and that that empathy is built in both directions. So I, I might have to steal that that question from you. I'd love I'm, I have some some folks I should ask that question to as well. No, and you gave a very insightful answer. And I feel like like if only we knew the work that people do to help us out, 
uh, I think it would make us a lot more humble. And thank you and everyone at Facebook who does the work behind the scenes. I know you guys get a lot of um, heat, but I think you guys deserve a lot of credit as well. And just to end off, you seem someone who's really passionate about the people you work with. We spoke about your team. Now we're speaking a little bit about the clients you work with. What do you think, and this is actually a question from the audience, what do you think has helped you and your team to maintain your relationship with these clients and to ensure that you've got this long-term relationship where they are constantly coming back to you, that they're like retained in a sense, you know, like where they are like your people in a sense. What has developed that relationship? Mm. Well, I think it's 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 a lot of it really does, yes, there are relationships and those are I think those are built sometimes in the the toughest times when you're in the trenches together, you're trying to figure something out um, or something doesn't go well uh, and you're, you're working your way back from that. If a campaign doesn't perform as you thought it would, um, et cetera. And I've found that those can be the moments where you do build a bond because you're, you're, in the trenches together, you're working towards the resolution together. And um, uh, so those those can be real trust building moments, you know, if to the extent that you're you're dedicated to, to fixing the problem and preventing it in the future. Uh, and then I would say, you know, these these brands, these marketers have really hard jobs to do. It's really hard to um, understand to the level that they need to exactly what is driving sales and building their brands at the end of the day. And uh, so so these relationships are built absolutely on the, the trust and our dedication to their business. Um, but the, the growth of our, our partnerships is also certainly built on um, how we're able to do that at the end of the day. And we work really, really, really hard to um, map to their goals, to understand them deeply, what they're trying to do, and then sell some cars. <laughs> <laughs> or, and again, very nice roadmap of maintaining relationships. I think it goes down to everything from the relationship itself, being there for the person, having that trust, having their best interests and getting them to grow, getting them to see those results. So again, brilliantly said. And I think that um, for all, we've got a very wide range of audience just looking at the comments. We've got students where we shared a little bit about um, your journey when you were a student and the things that made you, you in a sense, how you discovered even this industry. We shared how you grew for all of those who are stepping out into the world, the, the sleepless nights that you put in, the, the ability to go and find out answers to your questions, how you grew in your job and today, how you handle your team, your clients, your industry in such an amazing and I would say well-versed way which again for all of us here thank you so much for actually sharing all of these experiences it's, it's been amazing and I hope you had fun in this interview in a way yes this is great thank you so much and uh yeah I just hope it was I hope it was valuable very well very much so and I and there's so many questions I think both me and the audience have for you the audience doesn't normally ask so many questions so like that just goes to show that they want to know more but I think with that I we've got to wrap up for today and I just wanted to say that uh many times we feel I feel like um we don't really appreciate the companies behind technology and like it or not the world is becoming more and more immersed in this online virtual setting so let's all spend a little time this weekend or today in a sense and thank and appreciate those people like kim who actually make the world turn around at least the virtual world so thank you kim on behalf of all of the work you do uh, in the industry that you do but also from facebook in general and to all of our i think on behalf of all of our audience your experience has been so lovely to hear and we really look forward to seeing the amazing things that you do next time you see an ad for a car so anything in the industry we're all going to just fangirl a little bit and appreciate it a lot more to know that kim and her team are on it so thank you so much for joining us um, and with that, to our lovely audience, thank you for joining us as well. It's been lovely having you guys. You guys have been so attentive, asking questions, sharing your experiences, telling us how great today's show and thanking us as well. So until next time, remember, we're on every Thursday evening at 10 p.m. ET. See you guys next week. Bye. 
You're listening to Changing Reality. Changing Reality, where we bend reality all across the world. Only on WQHS Radio. 